Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kang Hyun Han of Division of Regulatory Toxicology Research at KIT. It seems like our division's name is quite complicated since the MCR was struggling to pronounce it. Now, let me begin my presentation. My uh, session will be talking about M3 guidelines. As you can see from the title of M3, it's about marketing authorization of uh, pharmaceuticals, and it's also about non-clinical safety studies for the conduct of human clinical trials. So there is the overall guidance on these activities, and this belongs to M3 guidelines. This M3 guideline could be utilized in many different ways. First, for regulatory agencies, and second, pharmaceutical companies when they develop new drug products, and third, uh, in safety uh, assessment agencies such as us. Depending on the purpose and the utilization of the guideline, there could be different interpretation. Um, since I work for non-clinical uh, safety studies uh, division, uh, I'll talk about M3 guideline from that specific uh, perspective. As Director Che uh, talked about uh, the overview of ICH guideline, um, I added uh, one slide to talk about ICH. ICH is for technical requirement for human or pharmaceuticals. This is an international harmonization um, agency. And within this agency, ICH guideline is developed. Scientific and technical issues are discussed under ICH. For regulators, and pharmaceutical companies um, are participating in ICH. It started back in 1990. Currently, 18 member countries, 33 observers are participating. As Director Che introduced, there are uh, four different areas uh, in ICH guideline quality, efficacy, safety, and multidisciplinary guidelines. M3 belongs to a multidisciplinary guideline, specifically looking at areas that does not belong to quality, safety, and efficacy. However, the contents uh, include safety study. So from S1A to S12, uh, this is safety guideline, and uh, the overall contents are also included. On the third day, we have uh, safety as a daily topic, and this would be a good introductory session for you. Next, document history of M3 guideline. As other guidelines um, are the same way, expert working group comes up with guideline after the consultation of regulatory bodies, the guideline is finalized. M3 guideline was first um, drafted in 1996. There were uh, two amendments, and the latest version is from 2009. Now, let me uh, get into the guidelines. The introduction slide talks about objectives of guidelines. The objective of M3 guideline, as you can tell from the title, is for non-clinical safety studies. There are differences among countries. So the objective of this guideline is to uh, recommend international standard and promote harmonization of non-clinical safety studies through this activity to support uh, marketing authorization and to provide support for clinical trials. Non-clinical safety studies types and durations are defined. And timing to support the conduct of human clinical trials and marketing authorization for pharmaceuticals. Next, scope of the guideline. 
this is a general guideline for drug development. If you take a look at the contents, pharmacology studies, general toxicity studies, uh, toxicokinetic and pharmacokinetics study, reproduction toxicity studies, general toxicity studies, and carcinogenicity studies are included. Depending on the specifics of drug products, case-by-case um, -case approach, phototoxicity, immunotoxicity, juvenile toxicity, and abuse liability can, are included. Recently, biotechnology-derived products um, are increasing, and ICHS6 is a separate guidance for biotechnology-derived products. This talks about when um, to do non-clinical studies for these products. So please refer to ICHS6 for biotechnology-derived products. And there are, is also a case-by-case -case approach required products such as life-threatening or serious diseases or innovative therapeutic uh, these products. So in this case, the timing and scope of this uh, guideline um, is not, may not be applied. Non-clinical safe study, when um, is it implemented uh, throughout the drug development? This is a diagram explaining the flow. Non-clinical safe uh, study from our um, agent's perspective is divided into non-GLP compliant and GLP compliant area. For non-GLP compliant, uh, this is for uh, initial screening toxicity test. And after that, with GLP study, inside this GLP study, M3 guideline um, studies are included. During GLP study, for IND, uh, safety study phase one, two, three, and toxicity uh, testing and safety studies must be uh, executed. Safety study for IND, uh, we do single and repeat um, dosage, do, uh, dose toxicity, general tox, and safety. For cl clinical trial, uh, after phase one, two, three, it's a case-by-case -case approach, but long-term repeat dose of toxicity uh, over three months and reproductive toxicity, ADME, and when necessary, carcinogenicity um, and other extra toxicity tests are completed until uh, marketing approval. Before getting into more details, this is the general principle of the guideline. There are, as you expected, non-clinical safety evaluation. The goal of this is uh, about assessing the toxicity and how to do the assessment. Here it talks about target organs, dose dependence, relationship to exposure, and when appropriate, potential uh, reversibility. The data is used to estimate an initial safe starting dose and dose range for human trials. During clinical trials, there could be adverse effect. So this data is used to identify parameters for clinical monitoring for potential adverse effects. And for clinical trials, it starts with a low systemic exposure with small number of subjects. And then gradually increase population, increase duration and um, size of the exposed uh, pa patient population and also those during this process, what matters most is that for clinical trials in the initial stage, the safety information is important. Non-clinical safety information must be also checked. 
four successful clinical trials. Next, high dose selection for general toxicity studies. This uh, is the important factor uh, to, uh, set, to set the low dose in the initial stage. And the maximum tolerated dose, it must be selected first. So this is the first time for a guideline to talk about high dose selection. In general toxicity studies, there are multiple standards. First, we can start with MTD which is the maximum tolerated dose for subject. Second is for exposure saturated dose. And third, physically applicable maximum uh, feasible dose. When there are no toxicity in three cases, for animals and cells, can we uh, Increase the dose without any limit? No, there is a limit dose of 1,000 milligram. So this is the limit dose concept. When the limit dose is less than tenfold uh, exposure of, of uh, the uh, trials, there must be a tenfold exposure margin or a dose of 2,000 milligram per kilogram per day or DMFD. So that is the recommendation. Lastly, pharmacological active dose a uh, minimum 50-fold margin of exposure for AUC. So these are included in the guideline as a diagram. This is a recap. As I mentioned, there is MTD, saturation, physically uh, dosable, physically um, available dose and mean exposure margin. And if uh, none of the above are applicable, one milligram per kilogram limit dose can be selected. 1,000 milligram per kilogram is, if it's less than um, tenfold, then uh, we check whether it exceeds one milligram of uh, a day and then it is determined as high dose. If none of the above are applicable, we go back and 2,000 milligram per kilogram um, dose is selected. If it is possible, exposure is higher in animal than human to uh, make it applicable. If it's less than 2,000, maximum feasible dose and more than 10 times of exposure are um, considered. And finally, select the high dose. If none of the above are applicable, we have to go for other estimation method. Next, let's talk about the test items. First, pharmacology studies. The guideline for pharmacology studies are ICH-S7A, safety pharmacology studies for human pharmacologies, and ICH-S7B. For, uh, so it's mostly about safety pharmacology studies. S7B talks about uh, non-clinical evaluation of the potential for delayed uh, ventricular repolarization. For cardiovascular dis, uh, systems and respiratory uh, systems are tested for cardiovascular hog assay and telemetry tests are included and for central nervous system Orwin test and FOB test and for respiratory systems their whole body body a uh, plethomograph. So these are the standard for safety pharmacology studies. It is must be done before human exposure and to reduce the number of uh, animals. It 
is uh, added to general toxicity studies. This is a recent trend. Among pharmacology uh, studies, apart from safety um, study, pharmacodynamic studies must be implemented. Depending on the effect, effect of the drug, uh, the mode of action is considered. This is how to do uh, pharmacology um, studies. For cardiovascular, HERG assay and dog and monkeys are inserted with sensors. We check blood pressure and the pulse, the heartbeat. These are the cardiovascular biomarkers, and we monitor them to estimate the impact. For central nervous, in vivo monitored neural behavioral parameters are assessed. And for respiratory systems, whole body plethysmograph is used to check uh, the respiratory uh, behavior. Next, toxicokinetic and pharmacokinetic studies for TK and uh, PK, ICH3A is the relevant guideline. TK uh, is using plasma binding data as a systemic exposure data in um, animal and human. Repeat those toxicity studies include this, including rodent and non-rodent subjects. The uh, TK uh, data and the study must be implemented before initiating human clinical trials. In PK, ADME assessment is done. The timing is before phase three. So that is the general recommendation. For PK and TK, these must be considered the metabolite of the parent drug if there is too much. Regarding human metabolite, non-clinical safe study must be implemented additionally. In this case, toxicokinetic studies must be accompanied. The cases requiring these additional tests include the dose-related exposure when it is higher than 10%. And secondly, in toxicity study, when the maximum exposure uh, is higher in humans than animal, then it uh, indicates risks. And these uh, tests and studies are required to support phase three clinical trials. Among general toxicity studies, there is acute toxicity study. There are multiple testing guidelines uh, from MFDS and OECD. So different testing uh, methods are available. The purpose of acute toxicity study is to um, estimate lethal dose and LD50. There are four different groups for male and female. This is a single dose toxicity study. And for non-rodent, there is a, a dose escalation study. And for OECD guideline, there is a chemical limited fixed dose study and acute toxic class method and up and down method. So these are available for acute toxicity studies. Historically, for acute toxicity studies, two mammalian species were used. Recently, single dose toxicity, a uh, separate single dose toxicity is not recommended because for drug products, NTD uh, can be uh, calculated. Lethal dose is not required. 
the drug tolerability um, is enough. So um, those escalation and other studies can provide important information. Single dose study is not a uh, must, but when there are specific situations such as a microdose trial, microdose trial is for very small uh, materials the, uh, in the initial stage to determine whether there is uh, effective action to human. So in the early stage for um, exploratory uh, purpose, when it's necessary say, to secure safety, separate single dose acute dose toxicity study is implemented as an additional information. For human overdose situation, sometimes we need to check. So this uh, must be supported before phase three. Next, repeated dose toxicity studies. Repeated dose toxicity, just like single dose toxicity, includes two mammalian species, one rodent and one non-rodent. The duration is the same as human um, clinical trial or longer. So that is the basic requirement. For repeated dose toxicity, adverse effect uh, must be clarified. When we say adverse effect, we talk about any potential impact on homeostasis including morphology, physiology, growth, development, reproduction, or lifespan life of the subject. For repeated dose toxicity study, we get the animal after acclimation. We administer the material 2 to 52 weeks and then have recovery period for reversibility. And then uh, we, autop we do the autopsy and implement series of uh, testing studies. For repeated dose toxicity results, this is to secure safety and low I value must be calculated. And it is important in determining the duration. For repeated dose toxicity studies, the duration is set in two different cases. For clinical trial um, support purpose, that is the first case. To apply for a clinical trial, if clinical trial is shorter than two weeks, non-rodent and rodents up to two weeks of repeated dose toxicity. If clinical trial is two weeks to six months, the duration must be set uh, as the same period. If the clinical trial is longer than six months, rodent six months, uh, this is chronic toxicity period. And for non-rodent, nine months of uh, chronic uh, toxicity duration. During the clinical uh, trial, before marketing authorization, long-term repeated dose toxicity uh, study must be done. Unlike a clinical trial, up to two weeks for both rodent and non-rodent, one month of repeated dose toxicity. From two weeks to one month uh, for a clinical trial, uh, for both three months, and from one month to three months of clinical um, trials, six months, and longer than three months, uh, the chronic toxicity study must be uh, completed for rodent and non-rodent in um, respective period. Next, how to estimate the first dose in human. As a result of the repeated dose toxicity study, the first human dose is determined. To do that, 
Non-clinical data is very important. Among non-clinical data, pharmacological dose response, pharmacological and toxicological profile, and pharmacokinetics uh, data are analyzed. The most important information is no observed adverse effect uh, level, NOAL. Uh, finding the most appropriate animal species and then PD and molecular specifics and depending on the clinical trial design the first dose uh, can be different the first dose uh, determination must consider safety so NOAL is the most important input let me explain what NOAL is this is the highest experimental point that is without adverse effect. When dose increases, effect gets stronger. That, that could be pharmacological action or toxical action. And uh, there is a homostasis impact, which is adverse effect. Right before the adverse effect, it's called NOAL. Next, exploratory clinical trials. Exploratory clinical uh, studies, just like microdose study, is uh, before the phase one to look at PK and PD and other biomarkers to make sure there are no issues. Those exploratory clinical trials for estimation of these information, that receptor binding is uh, carried out most. So these uh, trials are carried out and conducted before phase one for those limited human um, dose exposure is possible. Therapeutic dose must not be used. Tolerability and toxicity uh, dose must not be uh, used. Exploratory trials include small number of patients or healthy subjects. There are five approaches for exploratory trials according to the guideline. This is the table explaining that. This is approach one. The total dose, if it's lower than 100 microgram, and if this dose is one hundredth or lower of NOAL and pharmacologically active dose, the initial is uh, can be uh, given up to 100 microgram. For this clinical trial, the required non-clinical data includes in vitro target receptor profiling, uh, drug mode of action, and effect uh, data. For general toxicity studies, extended single-dose toxicity study in one species, um, non-rodent, is required. Toxicokinetic data must be submitted. For genotoxicity, it's not recommended generally except for special cases. Next, approach two. This case, dose is higher. Um, the total cumulative dose in clinical study uh, is lower or equal to 500 microgram. And when it is given uh, by given five times and each dose is uh, lower than 100 micron and each dose is uh, smaller than one hundredth of NOAL and pharmacologically active dose. And when the max start and maximum dose uh, does not exceed 100 microgram, as for non-clinical um, study, the same set of data for pharmacology. For general toxicity studies, seven-day repeated dose toxicity study is required. 
TK data uh, must be submitted. Repeat dose toxicity must include hematology, clinical um, chemistry um, must be included. Third approach is single dose study for clinical studies. When the dose is similar to the actual um, therapeutic dose, then approach three is required. Start dose and maximum dose uh, are not defined at this stage. Instead, starting dose must be must consider pharmacologically active dose and the toxicity finding of that dose must be considered as a base the maximum dose uh, is up to one uh, up to half of noel exposure among rodent and non-rodent, the most sensitive species noile uh, value must be used and up to half of that uh, level. Required non-clinical study in pharmacology, uh, safety pharmacology test is added for general toxicity studies. Extended single dose toxicity study is required for both rodent and non-rodent species and for required uh, toxicity studies, um, th uh, these must be added, and for general toxicity, AIMS essay is added. The next one is approach for the up to uh, 14 days into the therapeutic range. The dosing need to be studied within uh, the uh, 14 days up into the therapeutic range. Here, for start and maximum doses, it uh, becomes a little bit complicated for the start dose, AUC and NOILs. Uh, one fifties of the AUC at the NOIL can be the start dose for the maximum dose. If there is a toxicity, it can be one uh, without toxicity it would be one tenth of the lower exposure and only one species demonstrate toxicity higher than the noel and the species is showing toxicity or one uh, tooth of the uh, AUC at the highest dose and if there is a toxicity in both study uh, both species then uh, based on the standard risk assessment for non uh, clinical uh, rodent and non rodent need to be involved in the general toxicity studies and for the general toxicity mammalian system the chromosomal damage need to be assessed and next is the approach five uh, this is quite similar to approach four so you can refer to the details in the table and the next one is the each test items when those tests need to be conducted the first one would be the local tolerance study um, it is local tolerance study and it is assessing the toxicity, the local toxicity, depending on the route, therapeutic route. Non-clinic, as an, usually it is not done as a separate non-clinical safety uh, study. Usually it is a part of the general toxicity study as a part of that. So the local tolerance or the local toxicity is studied and tested as a part of the general toxicity studies. Um, in terms of the IV, if you want to assess the local tolerance in when the route is the IV, then you can do the separate testing or the study uh, for the single IV dose. And in assessing the local tolerance, the formulation needs to be similar to the clinical formulation. And before the phase three clinical trial, for the parenteral products, which can be unintentionally exposed, then uh, sometimes the assessment can uh, be required for that local tolerance. The next one is the genotoxicity. toxicity. 
as ICH as to be is the one to deal with the genotoxicity study. Single dose clinical development at that phase, the gene mutation assay is needed, and the multi at multiple dose in the mammalian system, the chromosomal uh, damage need to be assessed. Usually, the micronucleus system in the battery, standard battery is required, and usually that is completed before the initiation of phase two, two uh, trial. And in the battery test, or the test of battery, if the positive finding occurs, then in vivo comet assay or pivot uh, gene mutation assay, other methodologies need to be uh, utilized in order to see if there is any false positive or not. The next study is carcinogenicity study. As the name represents, it looked at the tumorogenic potential whether such potential can be materialized in human or not. Two-year long-term exposure to the uh, carcinogen, carcinogens is the usual way. And the neoplastin, if a neoplastin occurs in that long-term exposure, so it is assessed. And the survival is also uh, evaluated. And as for the neoplasm, the, whether it is benign or the malignant is also important to point to be assessed. The ICHS1A guideline discusses the necessity for the carcinogenicity study. When this uh, carcinogenicity study is needed, then the data from that study need to be submitted before the marketing application. And if there is a serious disease, and uh, if the drug is targeting at that ser uh, serious disease, then the carcinogenicity testing data can be uh, submitted post-approval. For carcinogenicity uh, testing, there are factors to be considered. First of all, usually uh, the carcinogenicity testing is not done for all pharmaceuticals. It should be performed for the pharmaceuticals whose expected clinical use is uh, continuous for at least six months. And if the pharmaceuticals has potential for carcinogenic effect, then uh, the carcinogenicity study may be recommended. And before the carcinogenicity uh, study performed, uh, we conduct the genotoxicity study first. And if the study shows that this is the unequivocally genotoxic compound, uh, then uh, the carcinogenicity study uh, can be followed. And before the marketing approval, the data need to be submitted. And as I said, if the pharmaceuticals are targeting at the serious disease, a life-threatening disease, and then uh, the requirement of the carcinogenicity study data can be uh, exempted or should be uh, submitted post-approval. Next one is the reproduction toxicity study. There is SEG 1 and 2 and 3. three. There are different phases. The first one is the feed or the fertility and embryonic uh, development study. Uh, Astrosis cycle, uh, spermatogenesis, and the parent fertility and the development of spring. The effects on those areas are assessed at the segment one. And afterward, afterward at the segment two, at the embryo fatal uh, stage, the development of the embryo and fetus are assessed. And lastly, the pre- and postnatal study is conducted at the segment three. The late fetus development and the process of parturition and the developmental uh, behavioral and the functional uh, functional uh, development of the offsprings are assessed. The red 
so uh, the rats are utilized in here. So the uh, the toxicity of the compound can be assessed in pre and also the postnatal period. And when we extrapolate that into human body, then we need to think about what to be considered at what timing and what kind of the reproduction toxicity study need to be conducted. Those are the things that we have to ask the questions. Let's say we do have the men. Phase one and tri uh, two trials can be proceeded without the uh, reproduction toxicity study. However, here, uh, the evaluation of the male uh, reproductive organ in the repeat dose toxicity study need to be shared and later on in the phase three large scale when the phase three is conducted ICH as five compliant uh, male fertility study need to be completed before the phase three and for women not of childbearing uh, potential For those women, like in a uh, man, repeat those toxicity study data can be uh, submitted. And when I say non uh, women not of childbearing potential means they're postmenopausal as 12 months with no man's without an alternative medical cause. And the concern here is the women of childbearing potential. During the pregnant period, uh, there is an, a concern for uh, exposure of an embryo or fetus. So in order to include uh, this woman into the clinical study, there are two approaches. The approach one is that the reproduction toxicity study can be done after the safety of that compound is uh, secured. Or approach two is that limit the risk by taking precautions to prevent pregnancy uh, during the clinical trials. These are the two approaches in the guideline. In the early clinical trial, without non-clinical developmental toxicity study, uh, segment two embryo fetus study, uh, without that, the woman of childbearing potential can be included. But here, the pharmacological agent type and the mechanism of that compound and the effect on the fertility, those informations need to be shared. And also, The concern is that when the pregnant woman is involved in the clinical trials, at every stage, reproduction toxicity study data need to be uh, submitted. And at the same time, the genotoxicity test data uh, should be shared along with the reproduction toxicity study data. The next one is the pediatric patients. When the pediatric patients are included in the clinical trials, the safety data are required. For the drug products for the pediatric population is developed after the drug is developed for the adult patient. Usually the dose is uh, adjusted. So juvenile animal toxicity data usually is not provided. The adult human, the safety data and experience on the adult human are used and provided and submitted before the pediatric patients are included in the clinical trials. And that includes the repeat dose toxicity study in adult animals, the core safety pharmacology package, and standard battery of a general toxicity test. And if necessary, the very uh, young pediatric patients may have some risk in the development or if the uh, pediatric population is the age of the uh, population with the fertility, then the reproduction toxicity study relevant to the age and gender uh, would be uh, provided. But still, there are some cases where the 
toxicity study data for that population is needed. So case by case, the juvenile animal toxicity study can be done. So the juvenile animal uh, toxicity study involves the one species, usually rodent, in order to see the safety and efficacy. And before having the clinical trial, uh, this juvenile animal toxicity study is conducted. When this study is done, the age and the dosing period or the duration of the targeted pediatric population is, in, uh, is considered in selecting the type of the animal to be used or the age of the animal. So that should be clearly considered. A long-term clinical trial when it is needed for the pediatric uh, patients. Then before the initi initiation of the trial, the juvenile animal toxicity study should be completed. And for dog, usually the long-term juvenile animal toxicity study means 12 months and rodent 6 months. The next one is the immunogenicity. ICH as 8 guideline deals with the immunogenicity. And the guideline says that the all new human pharmaceuticals should be evaluated for the potential to produce immunotoxicity. And here, the standard toxicity study and additional immunotoxicity studies are conducted. When, the standard, when I say standard toxicity study, it means that hematological changes in the repeat dose uh, study and immune system organ histologic changes or the weight changes or serum globulin changes or the occurrence of tumor whether such potential is increased or not, or the incidence infection. So the standard toxicity, immunotoxicity study data can be gathered. And for the additional studies, the immune cells population will be tested in order to look at the parameters for the additional immunotoxicity studies. So these are the examples like the T cell, B cell, NK cell in the mouse and the rat. Those parameters will be studied as, a par as an additional immunotoxicity. And of course, there are other parameters that are specific to a component. The next one is photo safety testing. S10 guideline deals with the details of the photo safety testing. When it comes to the photo safety, it means that the toxicity that can be caused by the light, allergenic effects, or photo uh, carcinogenicity and photo uh, immunogenicity, uh, the genogenicity. So before we conduct the photo safety testing, we have to think about what compounds can be the target for the photo safety testing. If the photo absorption or photo stabilities are not very good for a certain chemical property chemicals, then uh, those chemicals will be eligible or candidate for the photo safety testing. So information on the phototoxic potential of the chemically related compound is important and the tissue distribution of uh, the data need to be uh, reviewed. And whether it is a clinical or non-clinical, uh, if there is any indication of the phototoxicity needs to be studied before. So. Based on those data or information, we, need, uh, we decide whether we go for the photo safety testing or not. When it comes to the photo uh, risk in the clinical trials, we usually uh, limit the risk. By limiting the photo risk of, the st uh, of a certain compound in the clinical trials. But before phase three, the um, the chemicals with the photo safety risk, the data need to be provided. 
The next is the uh, non-clinical abuse liability. The drugs that can produce central nervous system activity can cause increased dependence on the drugs. For those drugs, the drug dependency need to be assessed with the non-clinical data. Before we move into the clinical trials, we need to collect such drug abuse liability at the non-clinical stage. And as we move to the clinical trials, the parameters biomarkers on the dependence will be studied further. Whether it is clinical or non-clinical, the dependence on the drug risk needs to be studied then before the phase three. And the study uh, data need to be submitted. And that includes drug di discrimination, self-administration, and also the assessment of withdrawal. So these need to be included in the assessment and submitted. And there are other toxicity studies. Those studies can be done, and depending on the class of the compound, the biomarkers or the compound or the drug-specific mechanisms can be studied in the additional non-clinical studies. And for impurities, in the test compound, and also the toxicity of those impurities need to be considered and they are well outlined in the relevant guidelines. And next one would be non-clinical safety item, which is the combination drug toxicity testing. When it comes to the combination, it means that it combines two different or two or more different entities. There can be many different scenarios for the combinations, but basically there are three in the guideline. The first one is that two or more late stage entities. When I say late stage, it means that it is post-marketing or phase three study. So the compounds in those st stages, two or more of them, are combined. So that's the number one scenario. And the second scenario is that one or more late stage entity and one or more early stage entity used together. Early stage is defined as compounds in like phase two or less, or compounds with limited clinical experience. That's the early stage entity. The third scenario is that early stage entities are combined. So non-clinical safety studies need to be considered and done for these combinations. And for two or more late stage entities, and they are used in combination with the clinical experience, then combination toxicity is not recommended for those scenario. And also two late stage products, there is no experience of using them as a combination in clinical setting, but toxicological concern of individual entities, there is no such toxicological concern, then the combination drug toxicity testing is not required up to phase two study. But when it comes to the phase three large scale, the combination safety data is required or recommended. The third type of decombination is the early stage 
entity with clinical experience plus a late stage entity and there is no significant toxicological concern. In this case, combination toxicity studies are not recommended. But for the later stage clinical trial, combination toxicity uh, study additionally is recommended. Up to one month duration clinical trial the safety data for the combination toxicity is not required. But two early stage entities are combined, then all the relevant safety related data are needed. And non-clinical development program is completed for the individual uh, entities and afterwards the combination of those entities. Non-clinical uh, safety testing and general toxicity testing, everything is done. So the 90-day combination toxicity study, repeat dose, is needed. And of course, it doesn't have to be always 90 uh, days, but uh, it c should consider the clinical use duration or the days and one species is involved in general toxicity or carcinogenicity studies generally are not recommended and although the reproductive the toxicity is not required but if the risk is expected then uh, the additional testing uh, is recommended so, I have explained about the M3 guideline, and I focus on the safety testings. The, te the specific test items can be referred to ICHS. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kang Hyun Han. Regarding his presentation, now uh, we will take questions. Those who have questions, please raise your hand. Those participating virtually, please uh, post your questions in the real-time open Q&A screen. Let me first take questions uh, from here. Those who have questions, please raise your hand. Yes, we do have question from the on-site participant. You said that we need six to nine months of toxicity study in rodent and non-rodents for the clinical trials that, that are more than six months. But I'm wondering if our population is pediatric population, then does this rule is same? And also, does this rule is same for MFDS and for FDA? Do, do you get my question? Uh, as for the repeat dose duration, the maximum, and of course, we need to consider the animal's lifespan. So even if the uh, clinical uh, duration is long, for the rodent, it's six months, and for the non-rodent, the maximum would be 12 and generally nine months. And the same is true for the pediatric pediatric population, uh, the animals that can accommodate the pediatric population age uh, that can be used. And the drugs for the pediatric population, if it has the carcinogenic potential or the concern, then there are different types of the testing that can be performed. Starting from the pregnancy, the uh, exposure can be done so that the lifetime exposure can be uh, done so that the carcinogenicity can be studied from the pregnant stage. Okay, are there any additional questions from the flow? floor now uh, we will switch to online question this is a posted question from um chat screen 
for uh, repeated dose uh, toxicity for a dog, neutral um, nervous uh, cardiovascular and respiratory effect. Can we uh, assess all of them if possible for cardiovascular and respiratory? I think these are possible, but for central nervous system, the impact, how can we assess the impact for central nervous system? First of all, your question is about a comprehensive study. I believe there are some agencies doing that, so it is possible for central nervous system. The basic parameters are explained in the test guideline. I am not the person implementing this central nervous system, so I don't um, memorize all of the test items. ICH guideline and other guidelines are talking about how to set the parameters and implement study. Thank you for the answer. Uh, we have another question. If time allows, we can accommodate the one more question. The question is about the photo safety data submission. When the data is submitted, if there is the compounds uh, of concern, uh, depending on the level, is it okay not to report it? I think it depends on the agency. If you look at the M3 guideline, they provide the principles, so we need to think about uh, the issue case by case. As for the photo safety concern compound, compound with the photo safety concern, if the compound has such a structure, then it is important uh, to design the clinical trial not to have that or limit that. And before the uh, large scale clinical trial, the photo safety data need to be, uh, is recommended to be submitted. Thank you.